Hi guys, welcome back for the episode, the episode, the weekly playback, episode number 52. Um, so apologies if I seem a bit groggy, I am. I have a pretty bad headache. Um, it was a migraine, but it's kind of downgraded to just a headache, I think, hopefully. It'll stay there. Um, and I just am under a lot of stress. This week was insanely busy at work. I've been busy trying to pack and that's not going very well so I can get into that later but anyway so I think it's been two weeks since I've seen you guys I think it's yeah I think it's been two weeks so I have a number of games to discuss and the first one I will talk about is Cosmoctopus so I guess I should come close there we go um, so this is currently on Kickstarter it is for one to four players it's designed by Henry Audubon who is the same designer as Parks which is I guess probably his most famous game uh, the art is done by George Dustiopoulos, I'm sure I butcher that, and it's being published by Paper Fort Games, which I think is like the sister company of Stone Sword Games. Um, so this is an engine building game. So I had, you know, showed it to you guys in my last video when it arrived, and I was able to refresh my memory, of course, and play it again. Uh, last time when I played it was at UKGE, and it was a four-player game. So this time I played a two-player game of it. Um, so I guess I will just open it up and show you guys some of the components again, but I did just publish a one minute video on this, which will basically give you, you know, an overview of this game. So hopefully I'll have a picture up here somewhere. Um, so basically on your turn, you're just moving Cosmo one space um, and you will take the action of the tile that he lands on. And then optionally you can play one card from your hand. And that is how you are going to basically get the tentacles you need. So you need eight tentacles in order to summon Cosmo to your tile and win the game. So that is what these are. These are your summoning tiles and you're going to put the tentacles around this and if you are the first player to get eight tentacles you will summon Cosmoctopus to the center and win the game. So you have tiles that look like you know some, something like this. So this one would give you an ink resource as well as allow you to take one of the cards that is face up. Um, there will always be three cards face up and there are four different kinds of cards in this game. So I'll just show you the kinds of cards and what they do. So red cards are hallucinations. Those will give you a powerful one-time effect. So in order to play a card, which again is optional, but you know, it's, I think it's recommended you do it at least once per turn if you can. I mean, you can only do it once per turn. Um, there may be an ability allowing you to do it once more. Um, so you have to pay the cost. So there's always going to be a fixed resource cost and then a cost that can be any resource. Um, and then you will get the action that's on the bottom. So hallucinations are one-time powerful effects. Um, there are the scriptures, which will give you a discount on the cost of cards. So that's a permanent upgrade. So you'll keep it in front of you and they can be stacked. Um, so you can stack permanent upgrades. And same with these, which are relics, also a permanent upgrade. And these will usually be giving you a resource boost of some kind. And then I think the only one I haven't done yet is Constellation. So Constellation, you'll put it in front of you and then you need to fill it with resources that you will gain subsequently, not resources that you already have in front of you. And once you do so, you will get a tentacle plus some other benefit and then you will discard that card. So those are the four different types of cards in this game. And you are just trying to get eight tentacles. There is another way to gain tentacles um, and that is from a forbidden knowledge tile. So there are these little tokens or tiles, I guess you can call them, that are forbidden knowledge, and there's four of them. And if you at any point in the game get the number of resources listed on it, so for example, this one would require you to gain 13 whispers. If you have 13 whispers, you can turn that in and get this tile, which is worth two tentacles. So no one else would be able to get it if you get it. Um, so that's a good way to get tentacles. It's a bit more difficult because at the end of your turn, you always have to discard down to eight resources of each type. So that is a more difficult way to get tentacles. Um, in my most recent play of this game, again, I lost by four tentacles. I was about to get my fifth tentacle, but then the other player won. So that was a bit disappointing. <laughs> um, but no, it's a fun game, um, you know, and I love moving around Cosmoctopus, so maybe I should have shown him to you, but he's a bit harder to show because I stuck him in a bag, but I'll take him out and show you guys. But, you know, I, l I really enjoy the theme of this game. I think it's fun. 
It's a very family friendly game, like super family friendly, meaning it's also very easy to learn, easy to play, and um, yeah, it's not difficult. It's a, you know, um, there is strategy to it, you know, and the engine that you build. But if you are looking for something that's like super duper crunchy, I don't think that this is going to be it for you. This is more of a family style game or something that, you know, if you are in the mood for a game, but you really don't want to exert like too much brain power, but you want to play a game, then this is the kind of game that I would reach for, uh, for sure. Because, you know, sometimes you're just in the mood to do that. So I think Cosmoctopus really, uh, fills that like, category really nicely. So I will just stick that back up there because I really like the way Cosmo looks. I think he's just super cute. And I've asked the publisher, I know that they already have a plushie um, that if you backed within, I think the first like day or something of the campaign, they would give, send you a plushie as well. But I've asked them if they will make an enamel pin. So I know um, I mentioned in the last video that I am an, an, a pin snob because that uh, prototype included some button pins. So I wrote to the publisher and said that it would be really cool if they had a hard hard enamel Cosmo pin because I think he's a super cute octopus. I love his big eyes. I love that, you know, he's purple. And if they made a hard enamel pin with Cosmo in the center and then like a really like sparkly, shiny, like uh, galaxy, like starry sky behind him because you can get enamel pins that sparkle. Um, I think that would just look so amazing. So I've already suggested that to them. And if you think it's a great idea, then I think you should suggest it to them as well so that hopefully they do that. Cause I think this would make for a really great pin. And you know, there are publishers, I mean, I won't call anyone out, but there are people and publishers who make pins for their games, which aren't exactly like cute or pretty or nice to look at. And I'm like, I wouldn't want to buy that, but I would totally get a Cosmo pin. So yeah, so I think you should suggest it to them as well. So I played that. So again, really family friendly, fun game, pretty game. It's just really nice to look at. And I just love moving Cosmo. I think he's just super duper cute. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so I will talk about this game which came in and I had no idea it was coming in, but nice surprise, Monolith. And what do you know, it's actually on BGG now. It wasn't the last time I made my video. Um, so this is for one to four players. It's a 2022 game designed by Phil Walker Harding. The art is done by David. David Tosello and it's published by Simon Games. This is a 3D abstract strategy game. Um, I know that they try to like attach some kind of a theme to this, but for me, I just feel like theme really falls flat, but it says, no one knows where these gigantic structures came from, only that the gods themselves must be involved. Who else could place such perfectly formed blocks with such precision? Many elders, soothsayers, and diviners have poured over these divine monoliths to discern some meaning from their structures. Are they prophecies, histories, dire warnings? None but the gods themselves know. As the builders of monoliths, players are working to compete levels, complete levels faster than their rivals to score bonus points. Points can also be scored by making and fulfilling prophecies, which didn't really, I, th I thought that part of the theme fell flat, or achieving specific structures with their stones before completing the monolith. The builder with the most points at the end of the game has built the, the builder with the most points at the end of the game has built the most legendary monolith and is the winner. So you are going to have this board and around the board there are going to be randomly selected pieces. So you're going to fill the lid of this box with all the pieces except for the one square pieces. Um, so there are different shapes of the different colors these ones you will set aside in a pile and then all the other shapes which are much bigger and of you know different colors like you know here's an l shape you can get like something that looks like this you know like all the tetris pieces that you would have in tetris um so yeah i mean they're all tetris pieces basically so you have all of these classic tetris pieces and you are going to shuffle those and there are five colors. So there's this teal color, orange, beige, dark blue, and then black or charcoal. You're going to shuffle all of the other pieces and stick them into the cover of the box. And then randomly a person is just going to pull out the pieces and put them around this board. And on this board, you are also going to have a card. So, this card is 
I don't remember what they call it, but it's like your objective. It's like a structure card. So there are different kinds of structure cards and you can try to achieve the structure card during the game. So on your own player board, if at any point your structure meets the level requirements for this card, you will score some points. There are different ways to score points and that's one of them. Another one is that you're going to have, um, so there's different kinds of points. Let me just pull them up. So if you score, oh no, I just dropped all of them. That's fine. Okay, so um, I still didn't get one that I need. Okay, so if you score a structure point, uh, if you get the structure, you will score the higher scoring tile, the structure token tile. Um, if you complete a level, when you complete a level on this board here, there are going to be, so I'll show you the two player board. So in the two player game, you can score either 10 points if you complete the structure first or eight points if you complete it second. Um, if you complete a level, there are going to be level tokens, which will be in here. Um, so you will take a level token. Of course, you're going to take the highest value one that you see. In this case, I'm just going to hold up a 10 for you. So you would take that and that will be a point. So every time you complete a level of your structure, meaning the entire grid is filled and you might be able to complete two levels at once, in which case you would take two of those. Um, but you know what I mean when I say complete a level. I'm not going to be able to do it, but like, you know, you would have to fill that, fill that, fill all the empty squares and complete a level and there's a complete level. You would be able to take one of those. And then finally, another way to complete, to get points is to make a prophecy. So on your turn, um, I'll explain what making a prophecy is, but on your turn, you can do one of the two things. You can either move the crystal, so there's going to be a crystal that moves around the board, and then you will take a stone, and you can only move it, I believe, up to three spaces forward, um, I think. Or you can make a prophecy, uh, sorry, you can move it one to four sites clockwise around the board, or you can make a prophecy. There's going to be these prophecy tiles around the board. Um, if you take one of those, you will slot it into one of your four sides of the board. You can only make four prophecies in the game. So if you put it here, that means at the end of the game, the side is beige. You need to be able to see at least 10 stones of the beige color in order to score this, 10 or more. If you do not, then you will lose this and not score those points. So a lot of, like me and my opponent, we didn't really make prophecies till we realized that, yeah, we're going to meet the requirement and be able to make the prophecies. So we would pick this, those up towards, like more towards the end of the game. But again, you can only make four prophecies because you only have four colors and you cannot, you know, um, replace a prophecy once you make it so you can't like take a tile and then take another one later to replace it if you realize that you're actually going to be able to have more stones than you thought. So that is the gist of the game and the game ends once uh, I believe when a player can no longer uh, add to their structure. Let me see. Oh sorry no. Um, yeah, when any player has completed the top level of their monolith, so level four in a one to two player game or level three in a three to four player game, play continues in the, until the last player completes their turn so that everyone has played the same number of turns. So yeah, so once a player can no longer add to their structure, then the game will end after everyone else gets a turn. So for scoring, again, you will score for the prophecies you made. Um, Oh, sorry. First you score for each of the four walls of your monolith. You will count all the cubes that match the color printed on that side of the board. Um, and it can't be like visible through a hole in the wall. So it has to be just on that side of the board. Then um, you, if the total matches or exceeds the number on the prophecy token in the corresponding slot, keep the token. If it's less than the prophecy token, discard it. So then you will also get the prophecy token value. And then you add up the value of all the remaining prophecy level and structure tokens you have, and then the one with the most points wins. And in our case, we had a tie. So then it says, in the case of a tie, the player furthest from the starting player in turn order wins, in which case it was me. In our case, it was me, so I won. So that is Monolith. So again, it's, a, it's just a 3D um, um, abstract puzzle game. So if you like stacking things, if you like abstract games, then you will like this game. Um, 
you know, the theme, like the whole making prophecy things, like I, I understand that they were trying to make it like, you know, um, like, oh, you know, who's building these structures and like, you know, there's some like supernatural power associated with it or whatever. But that part of the game like really just kind of like falls flat. It's not very thematic. You're just making structures. And, you know, I, I think that they were trying really hard with the theme because there are also like, you know, what appear to be like hieroglyphs and stuff on these blocks. So I'll just show you one up close. But yeah, um, the blocks are like plastic um, and these are cardboard, your player boards, and there will be variability. So all the, uh, you know, so if you play twice, you might get two different colors. So variability in terms of which colors you might be aiming for, because again, there are five different colors in the game, but there are, you know, um, blocks with four sides. Um, in a two-player game, I felt like there was not much competition for the blocks that we were going for, hence the tie. You know, in a player, in a game with more players, you might have more competition for, you know, the blocks that you want. And people might get the blocks that you want and really screw you over that way. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention, you put aside the one level, the one cubes, because instead of taking a stone that is around the, um, this, you could discard the stone instead and take um, one of the one cube sized ones instead. So you're able to do that if you want to. So it is a good abstract game. Um, you know, it's not like something that I'm crazy about, but um, it's a good game if you like abstracts for sure. So that is Monolith. So I think it's on pre-order right now from what I saw. I would totally play this again. I would play it at a higher player count just to see how it does at a higher player count um, because I think it might be more fun if it's more competitive. So yeah, so maybe I'll try that. Yeah, so again, a uh, good 3D abstract, you know, game. What else did I play? Let's see the list. Uh, um, oh yeah, okay. So I will talk about... Um, I guess I'll talk about Abomination quickly. So because, you know, it was Halloween, I played a two player game of Abomination. I'm, I don't have it with me. Um, it's at a friend's house. I left it at a friend's house. But, you know, it's a good worker placement game in which you're building a monster. And um, so you're going around different parts of Paris trying to collect fresh body parts, hopefully, in order to then use those body parts to um, um, so you're, you're collecting like blood, you're collecting bones, you're collecting like cartilage, I guess, you know, different kinds of stuff. And then you're using that to turn it in to get these body parts. And when you get a body part, it's always gonna be muscle side up. And then you want to turn it to skin side up. So not only do you have to turn in body parts, materials, to get the body part muscle side up, but then eventually you need to turn it skin side up. And then eventually you need to flip the switch, which means um, uh, you need to roll some dice to see if that body part will come alive. The game will end once a player has uh, completed their whole monster and made the body, the entire monster come alive. Or if uh, you reach the end of the, um, the uh, time tracker, the, the end of the game, the last round. <laughs> and then you would see who has the most points because you get points depending on how many fresh, like how fresh the body materials were that you used to buy those body parts, like then complete them. And then, um, so depending on the freshness of the body parts, your point value will differ. Um, and there are some other ways to get points as well. Like there's gonna be some random tokens put out. So if you're like the first one to do something, you might get some points that way. Um, so yeah, I, I love Abomination. I think it's a great game. It's especially a great game to play around Halloween. And it is definitely one of my top 10 games of all time. It can be quite long. So I always tell everyone, always play with the Igor, Igor variant, which is available on the publisher's website and it is designed by the publisher. So it's meant to shorten the game. Even with the Igor variant, it can be a very long game which it was for us, so we actually split it up into two nights. <laughs> so yeah, so I played Abomination and lost very badly, but it was really good to play it again after so long. I feel like it'd been at least a year since I'd played it. 
another game I played, which I don't own, but was a lot of fun. Oh, I didn't even read you guys the information about Abomination. So let me just do that quickly before I just move on. Um, so Abomination is designed by Dan Blanchett. It's a 2019 game. The art is done by Mikhail Palomarchuk Palam and Tony Sart, and it's published by Plat Hat Games. Um, and again, go on the publisher's website to get the Igor variant. So another game that I played uh, recently, which I thought was a lot of fun and I'd never played before, is called Anomia. Um, I don't know which edition we played. It seems like there's a couple of different editions. Um, so Anomia is that thing when you feel like you have a word on the tip of your tongue, but you just cannot say it or remember it right away. So I'm just going to read the edition for the information for the 2010 edition. So it's for three to six players. Um, it's designed by Andrew Eines and it's uh, illustrated by, there's really not much art on it, I don't remember, um, Kinetic um, Paul something, Paul Lon, Cesari Jolkch and Peter Walken, and it's published by uh, Anomia Press and Asmodee, I guess. Um, so you have a stack of cards in the middle. You're going to draw the cards. They have like different colors on them. So you draw the card in such a way that all the other players can see it first before you're able to see it. Then you put it down in front of you. And if your symbol matches the symbol of someone else, the cards are going to have different categories listed on them. Like it might say type of cake. It might say action movie. It might say dictionary. Um, so if your symbol matches someone else's symbol, you have to look at what's on their card and yell something that satisfies that category, that belongs to that category. So if my card said type of cake on it and it matched the symbol of someone else's card and let's suppose their card said actor on it, if I yell Tom Cruise before they're able to yell type of cake, then I would grab their card and I would put it face down and that will count towards my scoring. So my card will still stay out there until someone is able to yell a type of cake that has matched my symbol and take that card for me. So you might end up with a stack of cards in front of you because no one else is able to yell out correctly before you do um, what's on your cards, in which case, you know, you're just collecting cards from other people and they're not getting your cards. The game will end once the stack of cards in the center is empty and then whoever has the most that they've collected will win. There's also times where uh, you might end up with a wild card, which will go in the center of the table that will have two different symbols on it. And so when you have a wild card, if you see that you have one of the symbols and someone else has one of the matching symbols, then in that case, you will quickly try to see what they have and yell what they have. And in that case, you will get not only their card, but that wild card from the center. So it's kind of like worth more points because you'll get two cards instead of one. It is super fun. Oh my God, I really, really loved it. I thought it was a lot of fun and I really got into it. <laughs> so I lost by one card, but it was super duper fun. Um, I love stuff when you're just trying to like quick like remember something and then shout it out like so yeah so I I really got into it. Um, another game I played is let's talk about modern art. So I've played modern art before several times. This time I played like a small box version of it and I wish I could find the small box. I don't own it. Um, I've never owned modern art, but I wish I could find the small box version of it because it made me realize you don't really need a big box for this game. Like, so one of my friends, he's from Germany and he had the small box, which um, had like miniature, like money tokens in it. It had um, smaller art cards and stuff. So Modern Art is a game that was designed in 1992. It's for three to five players by Rainer Knizia. Oh, I didn't know it's a Rainer Knizia game. And the art is, well, it's, they use the art uh, on the cards that are by famous artists. So I guess those are like public use. Um, and then there, the publisher, oh gosh, there's a lot of publisher names, but I'll just read the first one I see here. Hans in Gluck. Um, I think it's also published by Simon. Um, so yeah, so in modern art, you are bidding for art pieces. So each player is dealt a certain number of cards in the beginning and there's kind of like a tracker. So, you know, depending on which art pieces sell the most in a certain year, you will assign a certain value to that art piece and then cumulatively you might be able to uh, you know in the next year if they still sell are one of the top three selling paintings then you'll add in another like value to that painting so um, you know you'll be able to earn more in subsequent years if it's still a high selling artist um, 
So this game, like each player is going to put down a card and there's different kinds of auctions you can have, you know, so you can have closed, like uh, closed bidding where you don't see what everyone else is bidding and you reveal at the same time. You might just go around and just uh, have a one-time bid and you only get the opportunity to outbid the person before you. You know, there's different types of bidding, but the card will determine which kind of bidding is happening with each card. And then if you, if someone buys the card from you, then you get the money that they pay. However, if you buy, end up buying a card, then you pay the money to the bank. And then whoever has the most money at the end of the game will win. So in a round, uh, at the end of a round, the player, the card, the artist, sorry, the artist that sold the most artwork, and you'll tell by looking at all the cards that are in front of everyone, you will put 30 million in that and you know on below that artist's name if um, the second one will get 20 million and the third one will get 10 million so then at the end of a year you will add up the value of all the artwork that you have depending on what they scored at the end of the year if anything sometimes you might get something with nothing um, and then because you know you only look at the top three and then anything be beyond that you don't you know give a value to um, so then you'll collect the money that you get and then those cards get discarded and then you start again um, so it's a fun game I guess I, I really suck at this um, so I could basically got a participation award from my friends for playing um, so because like they would laugh when I would end up buying something for like a high value and I'd be like but I don't get it like why are you guys laughing because it's gonna be worth this much and I'm still making a profit and then they tried to explain to me that I should also be mindful of like bidding too much still because then that person is getting that money. Um, so, you know, I guess I wasn't really grasping a strategy in this game. And it's true, I've always lost very badly in this game. Like I've never come anywhere near the top. So I guess I have, you know, don't realize how you're supposed to play exactly. Like, you know, what the best strategy is in terms of selling and buying and stuff like that. Um, so at the end of the game, they gave me, like they basically said, I brought a lot of personality to the table. <laughs> so yes, I may have lost very badly, but I brought a lot of personality to the table. So, which I always do anyway. So yeah, so Modern Art is a fun game. So we played the small box version of it, which has different artists than the like big box version, but it was still nice. I still enjoyed it. And if I ever get this game, I would get the small box version. Uh, I did find out that there is a stamp version, which is like a collector's edition now. I think it's uh, from Japan originally. And I saw a copy of it being sold on BGG Market for $700 which is insane. I would never ever pay that much money for a board game. $700, wow. Um, yeah, I've been a bit crazy and I think I've paid like 200 for a board game, but I don't think I'd ever pay 700. Uh, but you know, you do you. <laughs> so if you want the collector's edition, um, yeah, apparently that's a collector's item now. Um, so yes, yeah, so I played Modern Art. What else did I play? Um, ba -da -ba -bum -bum -bum. Let's see. Okay, so I played, I will mention, okay, I'll talk about this. So I've had this game in my possession for a very long time, but I've just never played it. Um, tea Dragon, uh, Autumn Harvest, a Tea Dragon Society card game. I really wanted to play this since it's autumn, and I've just been, you know, hanging on to it for a super long time, wanting to play it, and I'm like, it's got cute dragons in it, and it's about autumn, which I absolutely love. So I finally played it. It's for two to four players. It came out in 2020. It's designed by Steve Ellis and Tyler Tinsley. And the art is done by Josh McDowell and Kay O'Neill. And it's published by Renegade Game Studios and like Oni Press, Oni Games. So this is a set collection game. Um, it's a bit hard for me to remember the details now. It's been a while since I played it. But basically you have four different seasons. You have obviously autumn, winter, spring, and summer. I can't remember which season comes first in this game and which one you end with. But basically it's a set collection game. Um, it's a deck building set collection game. Yeah, so um, I, t I honestly don't remember. I thought the rules were a little bit weird, but let me, maybe this will ring a bell. So let's see. So yeah, you have a, each person starts with their own deck of cards uh, that you start with, depending on which kind of dragon you have. Um, and then there's four seasons. Um, and then there's like, 
so yeah reveal the spring memory cards for the memory tableau honestly it's hard for me to remember now but basically you draw a card from your um, deck you can either add it to your hold in front of you or and then trigger any effects by prompted by drawing it or and and then um or sorry you choose one or you buy a card so you can choose a market or memory card and pay its growth cost so you'll have a bunch of cards in front of you basically and that will give you money to spend essentially so like let's suppose you had these cards in front of you well it's not a really good example but like you would have two to spend and then you would add those to the discard and then um depending on which card you got it might go to your discard or it might go immediately in front of you but it's like a deck building game and different cards will trigger other cards um you know it's a cute game i cannot remember the rules exactly right now but it's got adorable artwork which i really love with all these cute dragons so like it's a very autumnal theme there are different types of cards which you need to be like careful about which wasn't very clear when we played so this the symbols on the cards could have been a bit better i think uh, which indicate which kinds of cards they are it also wasn't clear to us like who starts with this like mentors card like that was not clear to us from the rules as well um what else but yeah there's like each player will start with a different set of cards depending on which dragon you play with um, so like for example you might have like like here's a set of hibiscus cards so you might start with hibiscus so this will be your dragon which will give you some kind of a special ability and this will be your starting hand of cards which you will shuffle and then um, draw a certain number to begin the game with I think or not or I think you just put a card in front of you, something like that. I, am, I don't remember too well now, <laughs> but yeah. But it's a super duper cute game. It's uh, got adorable dragon artwork in it. So if you like dragon artwork, you might enjoy it. It's probably geared more towards kids to be honest, but, um, but it's cute, it's, it's pretty. So that's why I wanted to play it. So um, maybe I'll try playing it again sometime. But again, the rules were a bit unclear to me so maybe I'll read them again um so yeah so that is autumn harvest also played what else did we play we played um one night ultimate werewolf which I won't get into it's just like you know a party social deduction game and I will quickly talk about a game that I played on TTS called Salon de Paris it's coming out on Kickstarter um in quarter one of 2023 it will be published by Talent Strike Studios the same publisher that publishes uh, that published um, one of my favorite games, Camp Pine Top. I love Camp Pine Top. It's published Public Market. It's published a few games which I've covered in the past for their Kickstarters, Night Market, which is going to be amazing once it comes out. Um, also Top Pop. So, uh, and of course their big series, Vinyl, um, which I have packed up in a box um, somewhere now um, since I'm moving. Um, so yeah, so I played Salon de Paris, which is a game that will be hitting Kickstarter early next year, which was fun. It was a cool game. It's like, um, it's like an action selection game. Like you're going around basically a rondelle and then you will go to certain areas of Paris to perform different actions and you are collecting, like you're creating artworks, which you are then going to display in a gallery. And that is like, there's a kind of like a puzzle element involved there in how you'll score points because where you hang up your art piece at the end will determine how many points you get. So there's going to be a gallery in which you will place your artwork at the end. Um, so yeah, so there, it's a bit challenging in that regard, um, but it's a good game. So I love the idea of going around Paris and doing different things. It's, you know, a pretty thematic game. So I really enjoyed that. So I played a TTS version of that. So that was fun. Um, so let's move on. Um, so let's move on to games that I am backing. So first up we have, do, 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 do. let me, let me get there. Bum, 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 bum. So yeah, so I am backing the expansion to, well, first of all, I'll talk about Skull. So Skull's deadline is November 24th. That's a game that I had covered for them, but it's still not funding. They had canceled and relaunched. Um, so they're almost at the halfway point and they have 19 days to go. So that's a fun dice stacking. Um, it's a dice 
rolling, no, do you roll your, the dice? Um, it's, a, it's a fun dice stacking game. Um, and they have rune dice now, so they've like upgraded it to rune dice, which will be more fun. But it's, um, you're just basically quickly trying to stack something as quickly as possible and make a structure. It's a party game, um, but it was fun. So Skull, I'm at backing at the one dollar level. And then there's Hidden Leaders Forgotten Legends. I went a little bit back and forth on that because they originally were um, telling uh, backers of the first like the people who backed the base game the first time around that they would have to print a card at home um, and I was just like that's unacceptable because <laughs> like if you print a card at home obviously it's going to be of different quality than all the other cards and so I was just really angry about that and I was like no like you know you could they're really like you know like rewarding people who are coming in on this campaign and not the people who you know helped bring it to life during the first campaign like me so i was just really upset about that so finally they found a solution for the card however we still have to pay five euros for the new double-sided board um, whereas if you back now the base game um, plus the expansion i think you'll just the base game will come with a double-sided board so again you know we're being a little bit screwed over by that but um, oh well I guess <laughs> so so yeah I'm backing the expansion plus adding on the double-sided board um it's an okay game it's just the reason I'm backing it is because again I have you know completionist tendencies and I like the artwork um so it's the artwork that you know if I'm in the mood to play like a um area control or like hidden identity game then it's I'm not really area control um more like area movement I guess <laughs> um, then you know I might pull it out and play it um, I just really like the artwork and stuff um, then I'm backing Cosmoctopus at one dollar um, um, and then I'm backing Race to the Raft at one pound and then of course I'm backing the expansion to Canvas Finishing Touches which I absolutely love so I'm really looking forward to the final expansion to Canvas and I believe it's the final expansion and then Life of the Amazonia I'm backing at one dollar and that ends this uh next week on november 11th um so yeah so those are the games that i am backing so now let's go to games that i have received firstly i received um my expansions to everdell so i had backed the new leaf and the mistwood expansions which i guess i can grab they're here Ooh, doo -doo -doo -doo. I don't have the big box, I've already put it away. It came with this like gigantic box, which I backed as well, so that there will be a rule book compendium. Um, there will be like different kinds of storage trays for like the base game and all the expansions and all of that stuff. Um, so yeah, so because I had the base game and expansions from before, but so I backed the big box. So I got, I'm not going to open these up, um, there's just a lot of stuff. But yeah, so I got my Everdell New Leaf, I got Mistwood, and to be honest, I f feel really stupid about this, but the uh, previous, um, the, the base game and the expansions I have, I still have not played with my copy yet. Um, the first and I think I've only played Everdell once in my life maybe twice and that was with someone else's copy and many years ago now so I still have like you know this game sitting on my shelf of shame with the expansions which I've never played with so hopefully once I get moved in and have my game library set up and I sticker all of these meeples because there's going to be a crap ton of meeples to sticker that you know and hopefully I'll read the rule book and you know play this game someday because I absolutely love worker placement games and it's got adorable animals in it so how could I not love it right so hopefully I will get to play this game and I also backed the uh, deluxe resource vessels like the bowls and I don't know if you guys remember but there was like some kind of a lawsuit like I think they sent a cease and desist to people who were selling you know resource vessels for Everdell on Etsy which you know is crap um, you know, hopefully they found some way to get around that. <laughs> um, because I feel like you should be able to sell like bowls that can be used with a board game. Um, but hopefully, you, I think the reason was that they were using the name Everdell in their uh, listing. Um, so I think, I, I mean, someone could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the publisher sent them a cease and desist for that. Um, and then there is the card sleeves, which I think have like a back to them, which is cool. Um, so yeah, so I'm look I guess I'm looking forward to sleeving a bunch of cards as well. 600, wow. Okay, that's a lot of cards to sleeve. Um, 
a game that came in which I'm super duper excited about is Spires and Hildegard. Um, so this is designed by Greg something, Gregory Favreau, and it's illustrated by Diego Frias and Audrey Ravine, and it's published by Favreau and it's a card game adventure. So typically, you know, I I'm, I'm wasn't sure if this is the kind of game that I would typically enjoy because like you're playing cards. It's for one to two players. I intend on playing it solo, um, but the artwork is just so, it screams autumn. Like it just, this game just screams autumn and I don't know, I hope I won't be giving away any spoilers, but I'll just pull out some cards and see if you, I don't know if any of these will have autumnal illustrations on them. Let's see. But I just absolutely, the artwork just really got to me. Like I just had to get it because of this artwork. And I just thought it's, it sounds like fun actually. Like I remember when I was a kid and I enjoyed those choose your own adventure games. So I was like, you know, I really enjoyed those. Actually, let me show you the set, the side of the card. Maybe that will be better. <laughs> So yeah, so if you enjoyed like those choose your own adventure games, then I think you will enjoy this game. Um, so I'm looking forward to playing it. And also, let me see if I can find some better artwork to show you. Do -do -do. It's cute. Ooh, window shopping. Um, and it comes with like very autumn colored dice and cubes. So yeah, so I'm actually really looking forward to playing this. Um, I think it might be one of the first things I play once I get set up in my house because um, just because I think I'm just not gonna pack this away like in a box deep somewhere. So I think I'll probably just keep it towards the top so that I can play it. But yeah, it comes with these really nice orange dice. And then it has some other dice of other colors. And then it has all these autumn colored cubes. So, I mean, it just screams autumn, like, right? And the player mat, I got the player mat um, so that you can put the cards on that. Oh, well, let me just show you the box. So it has different cards of different colors. I haven't played it yet, so, you know, don't really know how it plays exactly, but I believe you're just flipping over cards and then making a decision. And then based on the decision you make, you will flip over some other cards and continue on in that way. And you might have some like um, things to defeat along the way. Um, but here is the mat. Oh, I love it. Look at it. It's so freaking cute. Sorry, it's a bit curled at the part that I really want you guys to see, but how cute is that? Oh, I love it. So yeah. So yeah, looking forward to playing this because it is super duper autumn autumn -y. So yeah, so that came in and then another game that came in, which um, was a back at your own level game, which I'm glad I did not spend too much money on. <laughs> um, so I'll show you that in a second. And that is Boz Chal. So I think this is the same publisher that published Chili Mafia, which is a set collection game, which I really like. So they had a Kickstarter for this game called Bog Chal from Nepal, and it was basically a back at your own level game. I don't know if there was a minimum pledge or not. I think I spent $10 on this, which in the end, I'm glad I did because there's like really not much to it. <laughs> so, um, and I can't remember if my pledge included shipping or not, or if shipping was still added on in the end. But I remember, and I think I did $10. I can just double check because I don't think it's too far back down. But let me see. Oh, here it is, actually. Yeah. So again, I don't know if that included shipping or not, because um, I think maybe shipping would have added on later on. But yeah, it was basically pay what you want, $1 or more. Um, you know, so I know some people were generous and they did like $20 and whatever, but um, you know, all there is is this like cloth and then a couple of meeples or tokens and then this tiny rule book and then this bag and that's it. So um, quite honestly, I'm glad I didn't spend like $20 on this um, just because it's a very like, there's just not much to it. I guess I don't know what I expected. Maybe 
I actually assess that that's all you were going to get anyway. So that's on me. That's my own fault. Um, so, you know, sometimes I just back stuff just because I'm like, oh, it's cheap. It's, you know, in this case, pay what you want. So, and I think they said it's like a game that they were just trying to keep alive culturally. So maybe it was just going to go like, they didn't want it to like escape from people's memories. And Nepal is like, you know, in a region that is close to, you know, where a lot of my family lives. So I was like, yes, I will get this. <laughs> so hopefully I'll play it. I don't know for how many players it is. Um, it's a two player abstract strategy game. Cool. So yeah, so it's very portable, which is nice. Um, so yeah, so I got that recently. I do like the colors. I mean, I think the colors are super duper pretty. Like this bag is just really pretty. It's a really pretty bag. And then it comes with these wooden pieces. So I can just take those out. Yeah, it's just like wooden tokens. Um, so that came. And then finally, the last thing that came that I backed was Dice Throne Santa versus Krampus. Now, they really need to come out with a, Hall a Halloween version of this game. Like maybe like... I don't know, a skeleton versus a pumpkin, like, you know, Mr. Pumpkinhead or Jack Skeleton or whatever his name is. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this came, so I love Dice Throne and so of course I needed this. Um, it's a really great play game to play over video chat with someone. So I'll just show you the Santa board. That oh, smells so good. I love the smell of new board games. So good. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. So his uh, things are cheer and eggnog. <laughs> That's cool. Um, I can't remember if I stuck these in here. I don't know if they go in here or if they're just something else, but it came with like these holograph holographic cards, which are quite pretty. And I'm not exactly sure what they are. I don't know, um, but I just stuck them in here for now. Um, I actually haven't opened the cards yet, but they look like they're also holographic, which is really cool. Um, and then the Santa dice are red and they look like candy canes, like the color of candy canes. They're so nice. Um, so there's like an X on one side. There's like a bell and a star. So yeah, really like these dice as always. I, I mean, that's one of the most fun parts about this game. Oh, and this like, uh, the combat points has like a reindeer on it. Oh, that's really nice. And your health tracker. Yeah. Oh, okay. Here's, here's an open one. Yeah. So these holographic cards are super duper cool. Yeah, so I'm excited to play this during the holiday season. It's nice to have like a holiday themed game and a combat game at that. I mean, you know, it's not something that you would typically get during Christmas season, I think. And then we have Krampus. Well, we have this. It's a patch kit for some games, for some um, different characters that you can play this game with. So Krampus, here's Krampus. And his things are coal, gift, and rejects. Oh, it smells so good. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Let's see. Let me show you his dice. So his dice are green. It's got a bobble thingy. It's got like a branch and uh, this like thingy, whatever that is. Oh, it smells so good. I just really love the smell of new board games. Here are his cards. These, are, it looks like, are not holographic. Well, these are some of his cards. Um, these ones do look like they're holographic, but I haven't opened them up yet. Wow, really cool. So yeah, super duper excited to play this during Christmas season. So I have a friend who um, I introduced to Dice Throne and he and I would play this over video chat. So I'm really looking forward to playing this with him over video chat. I think that'll be really fun during Christmas time. So yeah. So. I had to back this for that reason, um, just because I think it's, it'll be fun to play during the Christmas season. So those are the only games that arrived, and I think. I don't think I got anything else. Um, so yeah, so um, 
I guess my question is uh, related to um, my own personal um, stuff that's going on right now since I'm in the midst of packing. If you were moving and you had to set aside three games that you would have easy access to um, during a big move, what would those three games be? <laughs> so I've been trying to decide, like I still, it's been a disaster, like honestly, like having this many games i still have not finished packing my board games it's just really overwhelming i haven't even started any of the other rooms i don't have the help of family or anyone to help me pack i'm just feeling super duper overwhelmed and stressed out and i have like a week left to pack up my entire apartment by myself there's like literally nowhere to even stack the boxes that i'm packing is just a disaster zone. My apartment is such a disaster zone right now. Anyway, so I think I might leave just like a small box of games out. Like I'll have one box, which, you know, I'll label as games to open first or something like that, or just have, you know, that I can reach into and grab something if I want to play in the midst of all this craziness. So what would those three games be for you? Let me know. Um, I mean, you can tell me more, whatever would fit into like a small box, I guess. Um, so right now I have, I've left out a two player game. I mean, you can still see, like see stuff behind me because I still need to shoot one more video. So I didn't want to have completely bare shelves behind me, but eventually all of these will get packed up. I am planning on playing Lacrimosa this coming week, uh, weekend. So I'm going to be playing Lacrimosa on Sunday. So that will get, get played finally. And then I hope to play Dulce, which I still haven't played yet. So that's why that's still out. Um, but I hope, you know, I'm just going to keep some small games uh, that I can reach and play. So I've got, I think I'm going to keep Stellar, which is a two player card game. I think I'll keep that within easy access. I'm going to keep Skulls of Sedlak and Rove within easy access. And I believe both of them are designed by Dustin Dobson. Um, what else? Yeah. And, you know, I'll figure out what else to keep within easy access. Um, so yeah, so I guess that is it. Um, so yeah, um, I do want to just uh, say, or maybe I shouldn't say, maybe I should just not say anything. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I guess I won't say anything. I guess I've talked about that topic enough. I was going to say something related to a certain board game publisher in Palestine, but I think I've talked about that to death. I'll just tweet about it um, later. <laughs> so, so anyway, so I think I will end the video here. So um, yeah, so until next time. So I don't think you'll see me next week because that's literally like the day before I move. Well, I gain possession of of the premises on uh, November 12th but then I have my movers scheduled for November 13th but I need to do like a walkthrough and see if there's any cleaning I need to do in the new place and just get it ready for my movers and stuff um, so yes there's a lot to do and I have no I have uh, November 11th off but that will be a good day for me to just finish packing and finish up anything I need to finish up. So yeah, I don't think you'll see a video from me next time, but oh my God, the next time you do see a video from me, I will be in my new studio. So it might not look that nice in the beginning, but we'll get there. <laughs> so, so anyway, so yeah, the next time you see me, I'll be in a totally different place, which is kind of hard to believe. Like, wow. But yeah, so until then guys, bye. Mm -hmm.